Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today's guests are Jackie Carrera, President and CEO of the Santa Barbara Foundation, Eric Jolly, President and CEO of the St. Paul and Minnesota Foundation, and Lisa Schroeder, President and CEO of the Pittsburgh Foundation. Lisa can only attend via uh, audio, uh, so we'll be uh, prompting her as we, as we go forward. Uh, with the discussion. And thank you for joining us, panel. A reminder to our webcast guests that you can ask questions to the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and we'll try to cover those topics during the show. It's so great to have all three of you uh, here to talk about community foundations. They are uh, tentpole organizations in, in any community, uh, really supporting a, a network of nonprofits and connecting uh, uh, donors to cause uh, could you talk a little bit about how you are faring in these very challenging times, how your constituents are faring? We're going to start with, uh, with you, Jackie. We're going to go to Lisa, and then we'll uh, end up with, with Eric. Jackie, how, how are you faring in Santa Barbara during these crazy pandemic times? Yeah. Well, um, you know, I guess I, I should uh, start by acknowledging the fact that we are no strangers to disaster, having recently uh, at the end of 2017 beginning of 2018 experienced the uh, massive fires uh, wildfires and then subsequent debris flows um, and so while this pandemic is significantly different um, it seems endless at times um, we have uh, just recently put in place some infrastructure to partner with other organizations um, in times of disaster so you know our organization as a community foundation is I think of it as at the intersection of, of community and philanthropy. So we are poised, well equipped to spring into action. And I think that's what you know, we were able to do right away. Our community, however, is uh, experiencing all kinds of issues uh, and trying to adapt um, individually, uh, organizationally, from a government perspective. And so everything is in flux, but I think uh, overall, we have a great infrastructure in place to be able to respond fairly quickly and mobilize our resources. Um, we're very proud uh, of that. Yeah. And Santa Barbara, just as Pittsburgh and, and uh, really the United States has this attribute of having uh, real concentrations of prosperity and also real concentrations of need. Uh, Lisa, could you weigh in on, on how uh, that dialogue is progressing through this pandemic because the pandemic is not hitting everybody equally, not hitting every community, not hitting every demographic equally. How are you dealing with that in Pittsburgh? Yes, absolutely. It's been a time of on the ground action starting, I think for most of us in the middle of March um, for, for our region on March 12th when the health department came out and, and announced the, the um, astonishing projection of infection and death rate. And within hours, we knew that we had to get help to the front lines of emergency assistance. And um, Pittsburgh is, uh, to, to your question, Pittsburgh is, a, is um, unusually blessed by a very deep uh, philanthropic community, a number of large foundations that are that concentrate their giving at home. So four foundations, including the Pittsburgh Foundation, came together within 48 hours with a million dollars each to start an emergency action fund, which ultimately grew to nine million um, in, in, uh, with contributions from corporations and other foundations and donors and families. And so within 10 weeks, um, we were able to make grants going out to the front line um, before federal and or public assistance was available. So it was a, it was a wonderful example of a response of, of the philanthropic and the private sector coming forward within the, literally hours and days to serve those who were being hardest hit. And Eric, uh, Minnesotans are very well known for their generosity, for their neighborliness, for the, the way that the community comes together to support others. Uh, what, are you, what are you experiencing? And of course, we, we saw the origins of, of the uh, current dialogue on race, which I guess originated four centuries ago, but the most recent discussion uh, came out of Minnesota. And, and of course, um, that, that discussion is still ongoing. How is this whole environment affecting your operations? 
Well, it's been an incredibly stressful time for so many in our community. Um, we have two really very different crises happening, and we're trying to respond to both, and we see special funds with both. Yes, Minnesotans are incredibly generous. We have had more activity through donor advised funds through our foundation across the state in the first half of the year than we've had on record in an entire year. And, uh, and that's really wonderful. We are <clears throat> continuing to face the stress of the outcomes from the murder of George Floyd. And, and that's causing us to have a lot of dialogue to try and support um, to try and support our nonprofit sector and support our community in continuing this dialogue, making certain that we don't go, that we don't repeat one more time this history, which has been repeated hundreds of times. Um, so we're seeing that, but we're, we're also seeing a tremendous vulnerability in our nonprofit sector. In Minnesota, that's 14% of our economy. More than one third of all people in that sector have been laid off or lost their jobs. We are seeing uh, nonprofits that rely on uh, attendance in tremendous stress and maybe not opening their doors again. Uh, we're looking at how we can help support uh, more than just the relief efforts, the recovery efforts of our nonprofits. We're studying how Toronto responded to the SARS epidemic and brought back their entertainment sector because our theaters, our orchestras, our chambers are, 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 are in great distress. And we're studying how we can help with mergers and, and, and smaller nonprofits to continue to fulfill their mission at a time when uh, they don't know how to operate without social contact. You know, in many respects, what you're saying is, is what we are all going to face. There needs to be a realignment around cause, a realignment around priorities. When things are good, we don't have to uh, uh, decide amongst competing priorities as much. Now we do. And, and then we also have this issue of, of systemic racism and how to address it in a way that creates the kind of step change that was previously created uh, in the 50s and 60s through the heroic efforts of people like uh, recently dearly departed John Lewis. How do we, how do we uh, change? Um, talk, could, could you each talk about how your donors are seeing this? Because part and parcel of this is that you are organizations that assemble donors yes. in order to galvanize action that transfer, this is a redistribution of wealth. It's a voluntary redistribution of means to make America stronger in different ways. Lisa, you want to give a cut at how, how your, your donors are seeing this and, how, and the dialogue that you're having internally, um, and, and also the composition of your donors and how they're thinking about how they're informing themselves about, about the issues that people face, whether it's, um, it's, pan, it's the pandemic, uh, the issues of racism, issues of poverty, issues of community in and around Pittsburgh. Yes, um, our, I, I have to um, give a tremendous shout out to our staff and our board who for years have been um, organizing informative donor events around the, the, the themes that you're talking about, ar around the disproportionate disparity and impacts on communities of color uh, uh, from the, from the uh, economy, from the health system, the public health system. System. And, and of course, from, uh, from uh, systemic racism and, and the lack of progress in racial justice. What has been really exciting in this, uh, in, the, you know, in, in the face of this, this triple pandemic, if you will, is that our donors have stepped forward to a remarkable degree to, to make unplanned uh, donations to first the, to the Emergency Action Fund to totaling a million dollars, uh, actually a little bit more than a million dollars. So um, that was incredibly exciting to see that rising commitment. 
We are about to host a critical needs alert to support the, the most basic needs that are in crisis in our community. And, and our donor base has contributed $450,000 as, as an incentive to attract donations for 200 nonprofits that are serving those needs. So we, we know we, we did an, an, an analysis recently, which was, uh, it was very gratifying to see that our donors are giving um, in patterns that echo our grant making and and grant making at the Pittsburgh Foundation has been moving for a long time toward the concentration on on ending um, racial justice and and uh, supporting racial equity so uh, they they've been an absolutely critical part of what we think of for community foundations as the philanthropic first responders and Eric, um, when you look at your uh, donor community, uh, could you talk a little bit about the demographic of your donor community versus your um, recipient community and how the donor community is, is creating the connection that they need so that they're making informed decisions and inclusive decisions. I mean, we can, we can talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion in a theoretical sense, but really the rubber hits the road when you start bringing people together of diverse perspectives of different races and, and we have to have really frank discussions. How is that exchange happening and, 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 and how do your various constituents interact together so that we're, we come together and, and we're not having any kind of a paternalistic or a maternalistic or a colonialist attitude. We're instead together solving our problems, our problems. So we start working on increasing the diversity of our donor base. We provided one of the, we're one of the few, if not the only place-based community foundation that offers Sharia compliant funds. And so our Muslim and Muslim immigrant community is a part of our donor base. We created collective action funds that helped fund endowments for Native American, for the Latinx community, for um, the African American community. And that started a dialogue that allowed us to have meetings where we bring in the leaders of our community efforts, the leaders of our foundation and giving efforts, and our general donor advice holder, fund holders, and have had those dialogues ongoing now for five years. And so we've got a large group of donors who have done collective action to provide uh, emergency low interest and subsidized loans to at-risk nonprofits. Or one of my favorite, a group of donor advice fund holders who are assuring that resources get into the hands of underdocumented citizens. These are people who are paying taxes very often, but excluded from the benefits that are happening in the CARES Act. And we have donors who specifically said, get it there. We don't know all we need to know, except we know those resources have to be redistributed. So um, the donors have stepped up by engaging, by using a number of vehicles for that. There's still much more to do. There are um, great well-meaning individuals who we're working with to say, we can show you how to have more impact. The good news is donors across the spectrum are interested in making a difference with their, their philanthropic dollars. And they want to have that conversation. They're not running from it. They're running towards it in the aftermath of George Floyd. You know, we just asked a poll of what the biggest issue facing our communities are right now. And we ended up with uh, a, a real tilt toward the pandemic and then racism um, coming in. And, and I'm sure as the pandemic subsides, and it will subside, um, we will end up having a refocus uh, on, on uh, issues because the pandemic basically uh, bridges every single other issue that, that we have. Jackie, how are you um, bringing people together so that your community is, is served in a way that is is imbued with respect and an understanding from its internals of, of where the need arises and, and so that donors are, are completely, uh, to the extent that, that we can, conversant in how they should be thinking and acting from the, from the point of view of people in need. No, I'm so glad you asked that question. And I, I to me specifically, because it's one of the proudest uh, parts of the last few months, uh, we, 
um, immediately, and, and Lisa alluded to this a little bit earlier, as soon as the pandemic hit, before we even knew what was happening in our community and how long it was gonna be and how deep it was gonna be and what the impacts were gonna be, our uh, funder community, these are small family foundations, um, people who have donor advised funds, uh, other foundations, private foundations came together immediately and um, at with one single question, we need to form a collaborative and we need to be working together. We need to be working together to share information. The Santa Barbara Foundation, we have great staff. Are, are, they're incredible. They do community assessments on a regular basis. But if we just hold on to that information alone, we're not going to be able to solve this as a community. And so we need to have this forum to be able to share information quickly, easily, and make good decisions so we can every dollar that goes out is maximized. Within a few days, we had 30 members of this collaborative, and to date, this, this is a community of 440,000 people. We've already deployed over $12 million um, to work around the pandemic, and what that's done is it's created a culture of philanthropy in a different way. It's reassembling, you know, our reorganizing ourselves so that we are um, we're just more effective in how we solve problems and so we've built a great foundation with the, the work that has transpired through the pandemic and those same conversations now have uh, begun to seep into lots of other areas of our community and so when this the issue all the racial tension and the, the protests and all of that came up we immediately had a forum uh, to facilitate conversations between our donors and organizations that were forming for the first time to deal with that racial tension in our community. And, and so we're just building on that, those relationships um, so far. What you all seem to be indicating is a pent up energy in America to help ourselves, to help our communities and to help our neighbors, our neighbors who might look different who might practice a different religion, Eric, as, as you say, you know, we, we talk about this politics of division, but are we really that divided? When you, when you have people who are willing to confess their own ignorance and listen and learn and then adjust themselves and then give of themselves, we have the poll going right now in which we ask does the pan pandemic and its consequences, which are severely economic for all of us. Um, let's face it, there's, there's nobody who's coming out here unscathed, either on the health side or on the economic side or both. Um, we asked whether it will be more or less likely. We have 91% uh, uh, saying more likely, and everybody who I have spoken with is trying in some way to help their neighbor, to provide comfort, to, to talk people through crisis. Um, it's, it, it shows that America is not as divided as, as, as we seem to say we are in the media, in our politics. How are you experiencing this in your community? And, and we're seeing demonstrations all across the United States, but, but aren't we coming together in some way? I would like to have your optimism, Mark. <laughs> I would say there are many people with good hearts and good souls who are coming forward and stepping up, but there are still um, immigrant serving organizations where we have to provide support for security and for safety. We're still seeing organizations facing death threats. Um, the violence in the wake of the, the murder of George Floyd that's coming into our community has increased, not decreased. Yes, we've come together with great philanthropic spirit, um, and I'm delighted to see that. I think the good hearts have spoken up and are louder but um, that doesn't mean we've necessarily come together. And while many of us say the pandemic is our number one crisis, I want to point out that it's the number one inconvenience for all of us and economic threat, but it simply amplified some of the racial Im imbalances that we already have. It has had a disparate impact, far more so in our, our uh, communities of color, indigenous black communities and um, I'm delighted for all those who have stepped up. I need their voices. We need to hear them. They are reassuring to our communities. At the same time, we have to recognize the enduring legacy of racism, both systemic and um, active in, in our communities today. Sorry. That's a good point, uh, Eric. Uh, how do we, how can we be 
optimistic warriors and guardians and not optimistic fools. So let me say, I think it's time for us to stop talking about being allies. That's a, that's a wonderful thing, but an ally is someone who has your back and you have theirs. Right now, our black community needs accomplices, people who will help them achieve their goals of dismantling anti-blackness. Our, our people under pressure, whether it's LGBTQIA or others, need accomplices to help them. And those of us with power and resources need to step up and be present. We need to be co-conspirators and own the problem, right? Absolutely. Lisa, are you seeing this in, in, uh, in Pittsburgh as well, that, that there's that kind of a dialogue? Where, where are you in this arc of, of discussing how we address these issues? Yes, absolutely. This has been a very personal crisis for Pittsburgh. Um, the, the, Pittsburgh is the site of the horrific Tree of Life shooting all too recently and almost simultaneously, a young 17-year-old teenager named Antoine Rose II, young black man, was, was uh, shot in the back by police um, with no arrests, unarmed, um, as the, 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 the most recent and a numerate, numerous examples of black men losing their lives in, in uh, altercations with law enforcement. So we know that we have a tremendous amount of work to do. And um, to, to Eric's point, I think one of the, one of the uh, abilities and the responsibilities for community foundations I think is to really uh, dig deep and into the data to find out actually what is happening and where are the impacts to look at how our policies and our laws are exacerbating um, the, the excruciating trends to look at financial assistance and where it is needed. So we're, uh, we're moving uh, very heavily into the space of advocacy both in terms of shining a light on the fact that as, as, as powerful as philanthropy is, um, we, can, we can only go so far and there is public responsibility here. So we've been working on, care, on, on making sure that CARES Act funding gets to small and disadvantaged black businesses, to the vulnerable nonprofits that need it. We have legislation in the state, uh, state legislature right now to allocate $200 million to the nonprofits that are serving basic needs and human services, because if that sector of the uh, of the um, of the uh, providers, which is very vulnerable, fails, we we have a even bigger public health crisis. Uh, the dialogue um, is just beginning. I think I think where we're all excited is to see more Americans than ever before come out physically, visibly, vocally. And, and declare their their intent to make change, and and so the this is the beginning of of our doing everything we can to promote that process going forward. Jackie, you were yeah, going. I just wanted to add um, because I think you, Eric and Lisa both touched on uh, various aspects of the roles that community foundations can play at times like these, and. Uh, we've talked about certainly mobilizing resources, philanthropic resources, facilitating dialogue, collecting research, um, and really doing our, our, our fact finding and, and communicating that out, um, advocating, convening um, dialogue in our community. And, and so it is a really um, exciting time for community foundations specifically because of the role, uh, the many roles that we can play at that intersection. Um, and, and the way that we can use that power um, that we have and that access to information and resources. It, it's, it's really an exciting time for us. And I, because of that, I do have, I am optimistic um, because I see the potential there. Um, so. To me, one of the most fascinating things about what is happening to community foundations all across the nation is they are changing their character. Mm -hmm. Community foundations are, were created because donors needed advice. They had a willingness to give, but they needed to connect to community. And they wanted to be informed by, by your expertise in terms of how they can root their uh, inclination into real impact. Um, and, and so it was more of a, a service kind of situation. 
But now you're finding yourself by circumstance because you have these, these dual constituents of people who provide direct services and people who give, who have the willingness, you're actually in this amazing place where you can foster dialogue in complement to the dialogue that's being fostered in protest, the dialogue that is being uh, uh, fostered in art. You're actually in there now shifting your business model to become a, a purveyor of knowledge and, and uh, a, a, an exchange, really, uh, aren't you, Eric? I mean, uh, your, your, your points in terms of how you are changing in response to a, a sensibility that is not that did not originate with you. That's right? critical. One of the things that, that we did was, you know, most uh, foundations or donors uh, search out who benefits from our philanthropy. How many children, how many uh, senior citizens, how many animals were sheltered, how many acres conserved. We continue to ask who benefits, but we now ask two additional questions. We asked who informed the work? Who identified this as a priority for the community? We no longer want to visit solutions upon communities for problems they didn't even know they had. Who informed it? Who said this is what we need now? If you go to, my, to an indigenous community, we have such a rate of diabetes that we're less concerned with um, memory, assisted memory care living because we don't live long enough to have that as a worry. We have a different priority in our community. So, who informs the work? Who forms the work? Who actually constructed the solution? Are they of and from the community? Do they speak our language literally and figuratively? And in that way, foundations now are changing the focus of the donors to think about how are they hearing the voice of the community to serve the needs of the community? And how are they becoming aware of the emerging nonprofits, the small ones who aren't available online for giving? who are serving a niche market because they're at the beginning of a new immigrant wave or of a new need. That's what we can highlight. That's the kind of knowledge and resource we bring that bridges the donor um, desires and the community needs. And Lisa, I'd like you to comment and then we'll wrap up with Jackie, but I wanted to, to mention that we just, um, and the results of this uh, latest online poll, we asked whether the uh, online giving, this sort of electronically intermediated connection between donors and, and, um, and uh, 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 grantees, whether that's changing the importance of community foundation, foundations. And, and basically the, the majority of respondents, over 80% say that online is changing things, but it's mm -hmm. not reducing the uh, importance, nor is it making community foundations uh, more important. It's, it's, it's basically changing our model but this idea of in-person connection is going to persist in the, in the views of, uh, of our attendees, a very interesting result. Lisa, how are you shifting your institution, your model for operating so that you can meet the moment in, in the way that Eric just described? Yeah, it, 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 uh, in a very basic way, what we're doing is looking at our assets across the board and looking at how strongly in everything we do from grant making and working with donors, even in managing investments and, and retaining vendors, how can we align all of our actions and, and, and all of our philanthropy around these principles? We, uh, we, we actually had an internal culture values retreat for the last uh, th three days to look at how how do we align our own values around uh, around the importance of of driving toward a an equitable nation? Um, we also have um, done. It's been very well expressed, I think, by both Jackie and Eric. The 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 importance of convening and listening and and bringing forward the needs from from where they live um, and responding to those. Um, and, and I would just add that I'm really excited about the potential that I'm seeing of community foundations to work together as we all work toward both, both local, regional, and then ultimately significant national challenges where we really need to, we need to bring the public sector to the fore and, and, and start figuring out how, how do we achieve this more just and healthy world? And Jackie? 
Uh, I would just say that we have a big responsibility as community foundations. The joke is you've seen one community foundation, you've seen one community foundation, and we're, we are very localized. Um, and, and each of us has our unique set of issues that we deal with. Um, yet we can learn so much from each other. I think the challenge that we have, because there are so many ways that we can approach uh, our work and we have evolved in fairly recent times to play a different role in our community, that we will have to really take a look at how to measure our impact, where to put our focus, um, how, to, um, how to distribute our resources most effectively. And I think that's gonna be the challenge going forward in our future as we take on these colossal issues um, that, that we do all share. What you all are demonstrating, what this dialogue is demonstrating is that we can change ourselves. We can take people of different perspectives, different geographies, different ages, uh, different races, different religions, and be informed by each other and create the America that we envision. Uh, thank you all so much for your work. Uh, thank you for your efforts. Thank your donors. Thank your grantees. Thank those who educate each other to create the more perfect union that America should be. That's the nonprofit report. Thank you attendees for coming. Thank you for your questions. And we'll see you uh, next Tuesday for, the, for our next uh, segment on this important discussion.